everyone. Welcome to this live Q&A hosted by Clare Flip and Palette Association on the subject of orthodontics. My name's Nadine Steele. I'm a parent support contact and have been with Clapper since 2015. I'm mum to Amelia, who is almost 12 years old, was born with a bilateral Clare Flip and Palette. Um, so that's sort of my background with Clapper. I'm joined this evening by Bronwyn. Please introduce hey, yourself. Um, so I'm Bronwyn, um, I've got a cleft lip and palate myself, a bilateral cleft lip and palate, um, and I've been volunteering for Clapper for about a year and a half now. Thanks Bronwyn. Um, today's session is all about, about orthodontics um, and cleft lip and palate. So we'd like to wel welcome our cleft specialists, Alex Cash and Georgie Kane, who will be answering your questions this evening. Would you like to introduce, introduce yourselves, please, Alex and Georgie? Georgie, you go first. Uh, hi, I'm Georgie. I'm an orthodontic specialty registrar. I work in a couple of hospitals across South London and I'm also a volunteer for Clapper. And hi, I'm Alex Cash. I'm an orthodontist. I'm a consultant in uh, hospitals. I work at both uh, uh, St Thomas's Hospital in London and also down in East Grinstead. Um, I'm the clinical director of the, the cleft service in the southeast of England and um, love looking after patients with cleft lip and palate. Thank you both. Um, as well as thank you to everyone else who's also submitted questions in advance. If you've got any other questions while we're, we're going through this um, presentation, if you'd like to just drop a message in the, the notes and hopefully if you've got time at the end, we can get to those questions as well. Um, first question that's been posed by one of our, our contacts is, does every child with a cleft lip need to have orthodontic treatment? And if so, how can I know if a, ch a child will need this? So I think that the key about this is that if you think about people who don't have a cleft lip and palate, the statistics suggest that about a third of children have a high need for treatment. Uh, a third of children have a medium need for treatment and uh, a third of children have very little need for treatment. Now, I think in the cleft population, because there are a variety of different presentations of cleft lip and palate, uh, the statistics are a little bit different. I guess it's pretty inevitable if your cleft involves the gum that you're likely to benefit from some orthodontic care or at least advice about orthodontics. But I think if your cleft only involves the palate, probably your need for orthodontic treatment might be a little bit less. But, but I think one of the things that we need to be clear on is that orthodontics in general is a, an elective treatment, a treatment that you would choose to have rather than you would be told that you have to have. Certainly in the, the, main, uh, the mainstay, that's, that's the case. So um, you can always get advice about cleft lip and palate. And actually, ironically, even if you've got a low need for treatment, because you've got a cleft lip and palate, actually that qualifies you for treatment on the NHS. So there are kind of a, lots of different ways of looking at this. Um, and I guess ultimately, hopefully our job is to give families the information they need to choose whether or not they want to or don't want to have orthodontic treatment. Okay. Georgie, do anything you want to add? So yeah, so it'll be when you go for your um, reviews at the multidisciplinary cleft team that there should be an orthodontist um, present or uh, that is at least in close correspondence with the team and they will be the ones who will be able to recommend um, whether you could consider it and the benefits of considering it. As Alex said, um, it's an elective treatment. So if it's really something you don't want to go ahead with, then nobody necessarily needs it um, in, in that respect. But there may be some really great benefits of having it. And what we would probably say is there's a sort of time that's uh, the most useful time to have it. For example, if you're thinking, maybe I'll have it, but not now. As we're growing, is kind of the best time to have the brace treatments. And it might be as well on sort of a social element that actually everyone else at school is going through brace at the same time. So it might be timing wise, there's a certain time that we would be recommended would be ideal. Um, but it's definitely something you can discuss with your team. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so the next question is, how has the pandemic affected orthodontic intervention? Yeah, so this is a topic that changes every five minutes at the moment. And actually, if we had had our this talk 
before Christmas, we would have probably been saying that everything was more or less getting back to, to, to some kind of normal. But like in many sort of walks of life, um, the pandemic has uh, affected us considerably. Um, and in the months since Christmas, we have been affected yet again by the pandemic. Um, and so I guess this varies across the country, but just as an example from, from my service in London and in Sussex. So in London, all of our nurses have been redeployed again. Um, and you'll have seen it in the news that, that the NHS is really struggling with uh, patients, sorry, with, with staff being off sick with COVID themselves and having to self-isolate. And so, yeah, we've had to cancel patients um, for the last month, but we've just heard in the last few days that we should be able to start back up again on the 1st of February. Um, and so that will leave us with a little bit of a backlog. So from an orthodontic point of view, we have had some direct impacts from the pandemic, um, but we had more or less recovered following the lockdowns um, until that last little blip from the Omicron variant. I think that where our relationship with our surgeons is, is a close one, uh, where your treatment might involve a combination of orthodontics and surgery, Again, in my service, this is this is something that is impacted because the surgery has probably had more of an impact than the orthodontics alone. So, um, and this is this will vary widely across the country as to how quickly and how how much capacity services have. But yeah, I'm afraid the the pandemic has had an impact on on, on parts of the service. Not the same in all parts, but certainly on parts of the service. Yeah, and it's it's. We really feel for our patients and um, it's been really hard because with orthodontic treatment as it stands obviously it's not a one-off treatment that you can just go have one appointment and you're done it's longitudinal you're coming for repeated appointments and that means we still have patients that right back from sort of the march 2020 lockdowns could still be in treatment and therefore receive delays so it, it has been really hard and we really feel for us and what we can reassure you is you know as far as aware, all services we're very keen to get back as soon as we can and when the hospitals kind of lift the restrictions that are imposed on our departments um so we're hoping it's something that each time if it does happen it's becoming less and less they're shorter periods and hopefully it's something that soon will be phased out all right thank you um next question um we've been told our, our child will need braces but they're not really but they're really against it um they've had so much invasive treatment already don't want them to go through any more is there a less invasive option like removing braces or retainers so i guess like we said at the beginning that there is um the 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 word need braces is is something that is a it's a choice so in the main, we would hopefully give the patients the, the power to choose or to choose not to have treatments. And we would explain to them the risks and the benefits of both having the treatment and potentially also delaying and maybe having treatment later. Occasionally, you might, inverted commas, need orthodontics to get you ready for an operation. And, and perhaps bone grafting is a, is a time period where braces might be needed. Um, but in the main, you can choose what you when you have treatment and, and Georgie said it already very neatly that that you could you know today could be the right time clinically to start i.e you've got all your teeth through and things are in the right place and you're brushing nicely and everything looks good to start for orthodontic treatment but you're not ready to and that's completely fine you should find that that most of orthodontists would be really happy to stall and wait until you are ready and that time often comes when your mates are doing it so you know, nobody wants to be the first or the or even the last. Everyone's kind of happy somewhere in the middle. So if you can get your orthodontic treatment when your classmates or your friends are having it, uh, if that's the appropriate time for it, then there's no harm in waiting. And in fact, if that doesn't suit you and you choose to have it later because, I don't know, you play the clarinet or, you know, you, you want to avoid some kind of interaction, you can choose when you have your treatment. There's no question about that. 
Yeah. And in terms of the question, like asking about sort of less invasive, invasive options, um, your all scientists will be able to go through the different types of braces. And it's definitely something to raise with them, whether you could consider different types of braces. Um, so removable braces look a bit like plates that can come in and out and they're still able to move the teeth, though it might be slightly different movements that your orthodontist will go through. Um, retainers are designed to just hold the teeth in the positions they're already in. So they're slightly different. Um, and again, your uh, team will be able to advise you on an individual basis, what which treatment is suitable for you and kind of the good and bad of each one. And then you might be able to kind of weigh it up and be able to choose what's right for you. Yeah, perfect. thank you. Um, so the next question we've been asked is, um, can we get invisible or less obvious braces through the cleft team? So this is a good question. Probably I'm not going to be able to answer specifically for every cleft team. If you if you think there are probably there are about eight or ten centres across the UK, um, and a lot of those centres have uh, hospitals which they're allied with, who who may have different uh, devices available to them or different types of braces available to them. Um, in the main, unfortunately white braces and aesthetic braces tend to fall out of the remit of the NHS. Um, so as boring as that sounds, most of the braces that are offered on the NHS are the tooth, are the non tooth colored, the silver ones, but we try and funk it up a little bit for our patients if we can. And we've got all sorts of colors that you can add to your brace if you want to, or if you'd rather not, you can, um, you can just have colors that match the silver of the, of the braces. So, uh, although we'd love to offer our patients pretty much every brace that you have in, in the shelves or that you see in uh, in various uh, articles or in the in on various celebrities or whatnot, um, ultimately, unfortunately, the way the health service is set up is it sometimes doesn't enable us to use the most aesthetic cosmetic treatment. Right. Um, next question um, has been asked is, does it hurt to have braces put on? George, do you want to take that one? Yeah, so um, you're, again, when you go and have the appointment for the braces to be fitted, and um, they will talk you through kind of the plan, and how it all works. The braces themselves putting on doesn't hurt. It's very straightforward. It's just sort of lying back and staying still, and they're just um, set onto the teeth with a bit of tooth glue, um, and it's not uncomfortable. However, as you can imagine, um, as the braces want to start to move and straighten the teeth, that's when you can start to get the discomfort. And definitely the first time the brace are on it in the sort of first sort of 24 to sort of 48, 72 hours, they can get quite uncomfortable. And we do recommend um, having your sort of whatever you normally take for a headache or pain relief, you know, calpol, paracetamol on hand um, and taking that regularly just for the first few days. Each time you go back to have your braces tightened every sort of six weeks or so, again, they can feel a bit tight um, and slightly uncomfortable for the first day or so, um, but it's normally kind of in between the appointments just after you've had it adjusted that it will feel a bit tight. Uh, Bronwyn, did you have braces? Yeah, I did. I had them for, well, I had them like on two occasions. I had them for my bone graft operation, then about a year later, I had them put on to sort of realign my teeth. Mm -hmm. And how did you find them? Um, I. The, the first ones were slightly uncomfortable because, you know, that I had like an extra sort of metal thing going across the roof of my mouth, for the bone yeah. graft. Um, yeah. But my second lot of braces weren't really a problem at all. I forgot they were even there. Yeah, normally patients get quite used to it. As you say, um, if you have slightly different type of braces, like the kind of bar brace that you might need um, uh, for certain uh, treatments, again, that might be uncomfortable. And a slightly different when your orthodontist will be able to explain to you what to expect. Um, but yeah, it's just keep, keep it easy with nice soft food, give your mouth a break and um, pain relief and it's it's not sore to put on and it's um, the sort of discomfort doesn't last too long. Yeah, Amelia had the palate expansion brace and she said the worst bit was actually having the moulds taken. Okay, it wasn't yeah. The of the brace, it was the moulds. Yeah. That's the one bit of it that she, she doesn't like. Yeah, again, it's, um, yeah, they're not very fun to have. <laughs> Luckily, yeah, they're so quite quick. But putting braces on is actually is for, from our point of view it's quite a relaxing process usually because because yeah. we have to sit and concentrate for i don't know half an hour or something 40 minutes maybe uh when you put one arch on and so but if you if patients are nervous about having them put on 
then we would always encourage them to maybe bring their headphones or bring their phone. Um, I've got a really sweet patient who's the most quiet, timid young, young lady, but she brings an iPad and she plays some music every time she come. And I thought maybe she plays some Taylor Swift or I don't know, some, something, something popular, but she likes Slipknot and she likes thrash metal. <laughs> it's the most bizarre situation where I've got this, this noise going on when I'm, when I'm putting on people's braces or this particular person's braces. Um, so the next question is, my son's new braces seem to be quite uncomfortable and he says the orthodontic wax doesn't help much. Is there anything else we can do to help? Um, so I think, I mean, the wax is designed to be as helpful as it can be. I guess that there are, it is technique sensitive, as in how, do you, how you actually use it. Um, and I guess during the pandemic, the, the British Orthodontic Society produced a, a, a load of videos which are online and you can find those by looking up the British Orthodontic Society. Uh, and they have advice on how you can help with the various different issues that might crop up when you're wearing a brace. I don't think you have to uh, rely on wax, although, as I say, perhaps it's the technique that you're using to put the wax on. Um, sometimes people say it doesn't stay on very well. And, you know, if you can dry the tooth and if you can really clamp it around the area which is rubbing, that can that can definitely help. But um, you can also use other things. The wax is basically a barrier and it's trying to, to stop the brace rubbing you. And it, it's like it's producing a smoother surface for your lip to get used to. Um, it's a bit like one of those blister plasters, if you like. I think that there are two things, you, you know, people tough it out and within a week or 10 days, their mouth has got used to the, the, the brace. And so it tends not to be so sore. Um, but there are other patients who find that they need the wax or they need some kind of barrier. And on occasion, um, you might use some wet cotton wool or something like that, that just acts as a separator between your lip and the brace. Um, I guess also sometimes you might have a bit of the brace that, that it unintentionally is poking you. It's, it's, it's not supposed to, but maybe a wire has got bent and is, is, is poking you. So again, your cleft team um, can advise you on what to do about that. You might need to be seen in addition, or perhaps again, one of the orthodontic um, videos that the British Orthodontic Society produced can show you how to, to get out of trouble with those little um, little issues that might happen. They tend to happen in the earlier stages of the braces when you're not quite used to them and you're not quite sure what to expect. Uh, and maybe also if you've got a tooth that's particularly out of line, sometimes those teeth are more likely to rub you and uh, may need those, those waxes or those barriers to try and uh, help, um, help settle them in. I guess some people also like to use gels and creams on the actual lip to try and sort of toughen the skin up on the lip. But really, I think the message is that if you can put up with it for about a week, um, a bit like maybe if you do some gardening or some some procedure that rubs your hand, you know, you, you know how your hand will get the skin will get a bit tougher. The same happens in the mouth. Um, it's not permanent. And when the braces are gone, it all softens up again and becomes completely normal. But usually these things are just temporary and, and hopefully don't cause a long term problem. Yeah, definitely. Uh um, I've had a question. Will braces affect my son's speech? He's worked hard with his speech and language therapy to speak clearly. I don't want to feel like he's moving backwards. I think this is something that quite a few parents will worry about. Yeah, I guess I guess it depends on what type of brace and maybe also what type of speech work that the child's had done. So I guess that that, that a brace that, it, that covers up your palate um, so some of the more removable type braces or perhaps some of the, the braces that connect the teeth together, but they go across the roof of the mouth. Perhaps those ones temporarily might affect your speech. Um, usually it's one of the ways that we can tell that a patient's getting on well with a removable brace. Actually, if they're wearing it well, often they'll have overcome the speech difficulties that come with wearing those kind of devices. So um, I think a removable brace is more likely to upset your speech. A fixed brace probably less likely to, um, yeah. But ultimately, they, they, these transitions are usually temporary, and the longer you have that device in your mouth, the quicker you might get used to it. I mean, I often say to my patients, "You're not crazy to go upstairs into your bedroom and read out loud to yourself. 
you learn how you position your tongue to make the sounds that you were making before you had your braces on and you can get yourself a little bit of sort of gym work going with your mouth and and uh and that can help you with with lost alex um yeah hopefully he'll come back in in a second but yeah it's definitely just about adapting to it practicing you know that the evening when you get the brace fitted that evening recommend sort of reading a chapter of a book or something i um, suppose it just reiterates you what you've already learned in during your, your initial yeah, stage so therapy exactly whether it's going back to those exercises or um it's, it's just about practicing and getting your speech back um, as Alex says, particularly with the fixed braces, because they're on the outside of the teeth, um, they don't tend to affect speech as much. It's mainly the ones that have any sort of fittings inside. Um, but normally we see our patients adapt really quite quickly. Um, just once they, it's just a bit of perseverance at the start. Yeah. I suppose it's like anything that everybody's got to get used to something feeling different inside the mouth. Yeah, definitely. And our mouths are so sensitive. So um it's it doesn't it's not an automatic thing but the more the sort of quicker we can adapt the, the better it'll go yeah well hopefully um we'll have alex back in a bit but i guess for now georgie if you could try and answer this question um my daughter's going to have braces put in i'm trying to get her excited about all the ice cream she can have when they're fitted but do you have any suggestions for slightly healthier soft food yeah um, yeah, I've heard a few patients say ice cream is quite sort of soothing, um, mainly in that those first couple of days when it's first first fitted. Obviously, ice cream's got very high sugar intake, and your old Sundays will probably show you some pictures of our pictures of what can happen to the teeth um, if we have too much sugar with braces because they really do attract the the plaque and the sugars. You end up with some sort of bad marks on the teeth, so we don't want that. So thinking about healthier soft foods. Um, there's a huge range of things you can have it's not um if it, if we're talking about just the braces alone and not in um as well as the surgery um most soft foods available like you know scrambled egg porridge um soft pastas on we that's essentially it's a normal diet but it's extracting those things that are too hard too crispy too crunchy or too chewy and sticky so nothing that pulls so obviously toffees aren't great anyway but even those sort of dried fruits, really chewy things can pull at the braces. Um, popcorn tends to catch people out because you'll bite into a hard bit that was a bit too hard. Um, you know, most sandwiches are absolutely fine. Maybe not the crustiest bread you've ever seen, but kind of normal loaves are fine. So sometimes what's helpful is almost having like a little bit of a food diary of, you know, what you normally eat in a week before you have the braces on and just identifying the ones that look a bit too hard, too crunchy. Um, and you can always whiz that through the orthodontist as well. I always ask my patients when the braces are on and we've talked about the things that we try and eat and try and avoid what they're thinking of eating and not sure. Because sometimes there's those like borderline things that they're thinking, can I eat the crisps of my pizza or something? And normally you can give more kind of specific advice about what things to worry about. But yeah, we say that there's um, not that much of a limit. It might just be that you adapt the way you eat it as well. So for example, an apple is quite a common example. You slice it, chop it up and feed it between the teeth rather than biting into it like this. Same as sort of corn on the cob. You just slice the corn off and you can eat it as normal. Um, so you still have access to most foods. It's just maybe about adapting how you eat them or choosing the slightly softer version. So softer fruits, bananas, oranges, things like that. I know when Amelia had her palate expansion brace, um, mm -hmm. she had spaghetti bolognese for a tea, which we thought was great because it was nice and soft. Yeah. But the pasta actually got wrapped around the, the bar. So it's things like that that you have to try and consider that exactly. although it might be soft and, and yeah. you know, easy on the tea, you've just yeah. got to think that you've got yeah. something. If it's long, then you might want to have, you know, chopped exactly. it up. Exactly, yeah. Um, we, we, we learned that quite early on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hopefully, Alex. Are you happy for us to, to carry on, Georgie? Yeah, of course. We'll go as I'm sure he's trying to um, join Love us back at some point. Yeah. Okay. The next question is: Last time we were at an appointment, my son vomited. Now he's really worried. He's going to go back and doesn't want anyone to go near his mouth. What can we do to help this and help? And is this something that happens often? 
Yeah, so the sort of most common time this would happen, I'm going to guess it might have been in this case, is when you're having the impressions taken. That's what we call them. So the moles that we talked about before. And like you say, they're not painful, but sometimes they can be the, the worst part of the treatment. Um, and we have to do them quite early because it's part of the planning stage. So you've never, you're not really maybe used to having that much treatment at the dentist or going to see the orthodontist and then suddenly you're having this impression taken so there's definitely a number of things you can do um take it step by step don't think oh my god i'm gonna have to be forced into this and um, you will all kind of work to your pace um the first thing will just be kind of getting used to the feeling of the tray what we normally recommend is you can um take a tray home with you and you can practice sort of starting putting it in his mouth when he's able to hold it in his mouth for sort of five minutes feeling comfortable and he's sort of built up that ease and the comfort then um, we go back and maybe uh, give the um, impressions another go I wouldn't want them to be you know put off for treatment for life because of this it's hopefully something that you can work with and overcome um, but just finding different ways the other thing is always oh, back I think is some units have rather than the um, you know, the play-doh type impression it's like a a sort of thick pen which is a scanner um, and it beeps around the teeth and it scans the teeth that way um it is just available uh it, depending on your local service um but there's definitely ways you can get around it with your team and don't feel that you're you know you're, you're out of control basically take it at, at the steps you need so i suppose it's take every step each appointment quite slowly and just build yeah. up your, your confidence yeah. and Hi Alex. Hi Alex. Alex. On to the next question. <laughs> okay. Hi guys. Sorry about that. So I'm on my mobile now. Apologies. It looks uh, good. It's, yeah. It's okay. never known. <laughs> okay. Oh, you're out for the next question. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Okay. Um. So I'm worried my son isn't looking after his braces well enough, but he's dead set against me helping him clean them. What should I do? Um. I guess it's it's key that that good oral hygiene is is um, you know, gives gives rise to the best possible outcome. So, um, toothbrushing is, is super important. We would usually not start any orthodontic treatment until we were happy that the the patient was on top of their brushing and and that everything was working as well as it possibly could do. Um, but in terms of encouraging people to brush their teeth, I think probably the one thing that that um, we we use. That really helps show a patient where they could be better is those little dye tablets that are called disclosing tablets um, and they can be a, a quite a messy game they can be something to do in the evening rather than before people are going out to see their friends because you go out with a pink tongue or purple lips or whatever it happens to be but those tablets you chew them up they show you where you're missing your tooth brushing and that that helps families and patients uh, keep on top of their tooth brushing no doubt your orthodontist and, and hopefully your dentist as well will keep eyes on the, the brushing standards. Um, but really, it's a matter of, of, of the patient sort of taking responsibility and, and, and doing as good a job as they can do. Hopefully taking bits and pieces of, of advice, be that from family members or, or from professionals along the way. Georgie, anything you want to add? Yeah, I know Alex made some yeah, really sensible suggestions about the um the sort of dye tablets. Um sometimes it's maybe working out as well why is it is it a motivation problem? Is it a capability problem? Does he need to be given the skills and that could be some time in the clinic working out how to clean them better, or do we need to look a bit more into why he's not cleaning them? Is he not um maybe we could review sort of the damage that they can cause if they're not looked after properly um or if there's some other some motivational problems in terms of his treatment then that's probably something to discuss with the cleft team um and see if there's a solution there brilliant um next question is i'm not sure my family dentist understands clefts how can i make sure that they have all the information they need to properly look after my child especially while they're having their orthodontic treatment yeah, that's a, that's a really good question because I think it's key that everyone understands that your your family dentist, your local dentist, is the person who's 
nominally responsible for managing dental health and and ensuring that dental health and and that dental health often underpins all of the treatments that we can offer our patients going forward so um if you're brushing and your dental health is good then it opens the door to every different type of possible treatment that you you could you could potentially have um so it kind of harks back a little bit to that toothbrushing question um if you know if 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 toothbrushing is good and diet is good then hopefully you won't need a lot of intervention from your dentist but you know obviously we're realists and and there are things that that your dentist can and 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 should do particularly in in mind of prevention um but also we understand that that, that perhaps dentists may not see cleft lip and palate patients very frequently and therefore may feel a bit unsure about what they can do what they should do um and so the team's responsibility and 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 me as an orthodontist i will often be writing to dentists and in my service also we have specialist pediatric dentists who uh will also be writing to dentists and outlining the treatment that either we'd like them to do or the treatment that we're planning to do and that we might need their input along the way as well so it's really a, a team approach between uh, anybody uh, in the cleft team and and your local dentist and maybe the hygienist in the practice too. Um, so I think often perhaps some, some fear, even from dentists comes because perhaps they're unfamiliar with what uh, cleft lip and palate patients need. And maybe our, our job in, in that is to make sure that we give them as much information as they, as they can to ensure that they deliver as good dental treatment for our cleft patients as possible. Yeah, it's definitely a team approach, um, sort of using the resources of your dentist and all those letters that are being corresponded between your, maybe your cleft and hospital service to your local dental practice, you should be receiving a, a copy of as well, or you can always ask for yourself to be copied in um, so that you're getting, it's just made aware of sort of what's being asked of them. Um, and then it keeps kind of everyone in the loop. Right. Um, so the next question. My 17 year old is really self-conscious about her braces as all of her friends have had theirs removed already. Um, she doesn't want to smile often and she covers her mouth to hide the braces. How can I help her feel better about wearing braces and what happens if she wants them removed early? Yeah, this, this is a really tricky problem. Um, it's not just uh, cleft lip and palate patients who have treatment later on in life. Um, there are patients who, for example, they shed their teeth very late and so they, they don't get to their orthodontic uh, timings until later on in life. But it is a really tough process to go through when your friends are finishing their treatments. Um, and in, in the same way, as I said earlier, some patients wait until their friends are starting their treatment. It, it's not easy to be the, the patient who's, who's still having care when they're, when they're older. So we, we fully get that. And I think one of the things that we can try to do for, for our patients is, is at least give you some idea of when your treatment will end um, so that we're not seemingly stringing things out for a long period of time, keeping patients dangling on the end of a, of a string. So um, I think our job is to give you the information you need to, to understand how long your treatment's going to last and, and but what are the benefits of your treatment as well and so i think um if, as much as it is possible to if you can encourage your your children to to see the long game to see the bigger picture to see the outcome that we're all striving for that's the thing that we would really appreciate um and it's as i say it's part of our job to do that too um so it, again it's a sort of a real team approach to try and make sure that that we're giving you the information you need to be able to make a decision about treatments. And I think that, that, that you said, Bronwyn, that you've had two sets of orthodontic treatments. Um, so, you know, we want our treatments to be as punchy as possible, i.e. deliver as much in as short a space of time as possible. But generally, generally orthodontics is not a quick process. And, uh, you know, if, if you're getting things done in, in a year, you've done incredibly well but more likely many more years, or at least several opportunities, perhaps several courses of treatment over a couple of years as well. So we understand that it's a, it can be a, a long drawn out process. Um, we don't want patients to get worn out halfway through 
and decide that they're going to discontinue their treatment especially if, for example you've had to have teeth taken out along the way and so you might you know consider taking off your braces before the spaces have been closed up or something like that we'd really hope that we we never get into that kind of situation but ultimately you know the patient is the person wearing the braces it is their treatment it is their decision to carry on with it or to potentially pause it or park it for a while so um like I say, I think the information and the, and the liaison between the orthodontist and the patient is the key here so that we can all be sure that we're, we've got the same objectives and hopefully delivering treatment across a, as quick a treatment plan as possible. Yeah, definitely. Um, and just a bit more mentioning about um, what happens if she wanted them removed early. As sort of Alex said, it comes down to uh, what the patient wants. So it's going back to what kind of bothers them the most about their teeth and what we can change with the braces. Um, and that's a discussion to have with your orthodontist, whether they can also take some pictures of your teeth and explain the kind of different scenarios. Okay, if we would take the, the brace off at this stage, it's a bit early because there'll still be a gap here. And the patient's able to weigh up, you know what, I'm happy to accept that so that I get them off earlier. Or whether it kind of actually reinforces, okay, you know what, if I can keep going, then I'm going to, Kind of get these results and we're always trying to aim for the absolute certain best possible outcome for the patient and um, but that's definitely on balance with exactly what they want to address and what they want to achieve so yes yeah, so go back to your team and have a, a good discussion with them and maybe try and get a bit more information about um what finishing or removing them early would look like and what the gains would be if you're able to um just carry on with the rest of the treatment it's just encouraging patients all the way through because it, it is such a long process really yeah. isn't it yeah and and life gets in the way you know if you have if they might have had their brace on at high school now they're moving into college think about uni all of our priorities change and kind of how we also kind of approach to life and things change our friendship groups change our plans for studying change so and all the way through we're expecting people to really look after their braces come to their appointments you know every uh, every month or so so it, it really is a lot to ask of patients oh, but it's, it's, as you say it's just reiterating that they've got that support there all throughout it all so yeah i, I think um, we're, we're, we're well aware as well that you know for for you parents it, it's a big deal right so so if, if your child's got 20 appointments across two years that's 20 days of, of um, mum or dad coming out of work and, and taking your child to, to the orthodontist. So, you know, again, we try to, where we can, link up with our other colleagues. So, for example, if your child is having some speech therapy, you know, could you do the two appointments on the same day to try and save the family's trips? That's that's something that that is is very pertinent in our minds. And, and I think it's about 20 years now since cleft lip and palate services have all been centralised into these sort of mega centres which only look after um, the, the local the local patients with cleft lip and palate. But we're aware that having done that, that it means that patients perhaps may have to travel reasonable distances to, to access their care. So as I say, we're, we're very mindful of the fact that, that distances um, and therefore you know how, how suitable or how appropriate it is to fit in some long treatments across somebody's life um we're, we're well aware of the, those kind of social impacts as well so um I, I think one other last thing to say is that is that you know you might have exams coming up for example and so if you're looking after your teeth well and if you're looking after your braces well although it does extend your treatment the time of your treatment a little bit maybe your intervals between appointments could lengthen out a little bit to enable you to achieve whatever goals you've got at school or college or whatever it might be, so that, that your treatment maybe doesn't get in the way of, of other things in life that you wanna get on with. And, and you know, some, some patients say, oh, I'm gonna put this off and I wanna do this all in my gap year and I don't wanna do anything until that time. I, I think that we try to encourage patients to to seize every opportunity that, that, that life gives them so that they can uh, they can get as m m many experiences in all sorts of different things as they can do and, and hope that their their cleft treatments can fit in as best as possible around that. It, it's really difficult to try and compartmentalize life and say, right, I'm gonna do my braces in this, this year um, because often things happen, you know, a pandemic happens and 
that knocks all of your timings off and, and everything goes wrong. And, and then, you know, it, we don't want you to have expectations that you're going to finish within a certain time period and then something happens and that, and that disappoints you. So, like I said at the very beginning, we want to try and outline what the benefits of the treatment are, what the risks of the treatment are, key, how long the treatment's going to take. But, and, and then you can choose if that's something that suits you and if that's something that you want to go for. Because just keep up your dialogue with your orthodontics team and, you know, as you say, to contact your cleft team coordinators and, you know, as you say, get appointments on the same day, same week or whatever. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Brilliant. Next question we've had is, I've been reading about jaw surgery and how my teeth need to be moved into position first. Does this mean they'll be out of alignment until I have the surgery? And this isn't really is, and isn't this really uncomfortable? Okay, um, I don't know quite how this is going to work because my internet's gone down and I'm now on my mobile, as I say. But I did a little, a little PowerPoint, and I might just turn my phone around and show you my my computer screen. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me, guys? Can you see that? I think you might have just tapped your video off, uh, uh -huh. but we could do before. Thank you. But we could before. Uh, okay, the, the answer to that question is, um, it shouldn't do. Um, in preparation for, for jaw surgery, um, Your, your teeth are moved to enable the jaw um, to deliver the best possible outcome. Yes, we move your teeth into a slightly different position, but that position is, uh, is, is so because it, it enables the surgeon to move the jaws into the best possible place. Am I, am I back on again, video-wise? You are. Yeah, video's on, yeah. Okay. So... For example, this, this image shows a position of the teeth before jaw surgery in a patient who's got a stronger lower jaw. I appreciate it's a sort of funny side-on view of somebody's face. So this is the nose, the, the upper lip, and the yellow things are the, are the teeth. Um, but this is a common sort of presentation of patients who, who need jaw surgery. The orthodontic treatment is designed to put the teeth at the correct angles on each of those jaws. So you can see as I sort of scroll between these two screens that we've got the, um, the, the teeth in their, in their natural positions here. And then the orthodontics is designed to move the teeth into a position that gets you ready for the operation. And the reason for that is you can see that the, the teeth change their angles. As part of the orthodontic plan, the angles of those teeth have changed. And the reason being, when the top jaw is brought forward, you can see how the, the relationship of those teeth moves so that they bite nicely and they produce the best possible sort of facial profile along the way. So there's the sort of pre-treatment position, the post-treatment position and the post-jaw surgery position. So those, those images are designed just to sort of help out, uh, help understand what the orthodontics is doing before the operation. Um, it, it doesn't People don't tend to find that the, the changes make them particularly self-conscious or are particularly uncomfortable, but um, it is part of the process that you would go through if you were going, going to move ahead with your surgery. And I think sometimes it's explained as just your teeth might be put into a, into a worse position, but it, it's sort of, as Alex showed, it's just sort of changing the angles of the teeth. Um, that, uh, but I think sometimes this sort of conjures up images of people thinking, oh, my teeth are going to be put all over the place. And it's still part of um, kind of the brace plan. Uh, it's, it's, they're not suddenly kind of put all over the place. Um, it's not normally any more uncomfortable than if the teeth were being moved into a different position. Um, it might change how you eat slightly, but it doesn't normally have too much of an effect. And as we talked about before, our diet kind of changes with braces anyway. And we're a bit more conscious and adaptable about the way we eat. It's kind of no much more so than someone else going through braces. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, so the next question is, I'm 30 and I've had a lot of cleft treatment as a child, including braces for several years. I've had bad experiences with local dentists not understanding my needs and so I've avoided going. Could I be seen by the cleft team dentist or orthodontic team instead? So I guess I'm speaking for my own service here because I know how that one is, is set up particularly and, and all services are more or less the same, but every service has some, some vague differences. So the answer generally is, is, is if you have problems with your teeth that are because of your cleft lip and palate, uh, you may be able to access care through the restorative dentist within the team. But as we sort of said when we were talking about general dentists earlier, usually it is the general dentist's responsibility to maintain teeth into the, into, for the long term, into, for the rest of your life, for the whole of your life. Um, but I get it, you know, there are some patients who've had bad experiences and, and that makes them anxious. I, I think that often uh, cleft teams are often in, in or near dental teaching hospitals and those hospitals often have departments in them for very nervous patients. Uh, and so cleft teams can refer patients to those, those places. Um, so yeah, there are things that can be can be organised via the the cleft team dentist and orthodontist. Um, so if you if you if you haven't been back into the cleft service for a while, by all means get your dentist or your doctor even to refer you to the cleft team. Um, your local city will probably have your cleft centre in it, and um, yeah, you can access clinical care through 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 those those ways. Um, it's it's you, you may end up doing a little bit of traveling as we were saying earlier to get to those places but you will see people who are familiar with patients with cleft lip and palate and will be able to work with your local dentist perhaps to get uh, routine dentistry underway um, and when where they where they need specialist care potentially that can be provided in the hospital setting as well what? Next question is, uh, I'm 52, I've been unhappy with my teeth my whole life, but my dentist says because of my cleft that trying to change the position of my teeth will be too risky. Is there anything I can do and I can't afford to go private? Um, <clears throat> yeah, we, we, I think one of the things that, that we see, particularly in, in, our, in our service in the southeast of England, uh, is that a lot of patients who perhaps didn't have the best care when they were in their, in their younger years or perhaps um, want to come back for some further care in their later life, do do, do that. Um, so first of all, I would say that you should always come to see specialist clinicians if you have a, a worry that you think you need to address. Um, and like I said earlier, your dentist may not necessarily be the best person to provide that care for you but they would certainly be an avenue to refer you to the cleft team to get specialist care, specialist care or a specialist treatment plan provided. Um, I, I would say very strongly that un, unless you have deep trust in your dentist and that they are competent in delivering care for cleft lip and palate patients, that I wouldn't embark on an expensive private treatment plan without first considering whether or not that's um, going to provide you with the with what you want. Um, th there's no question that 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 some dentistry, uh, because of the cleft, can be in vertical as risky, as in the question. Um, I think that's where the, the 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 input of the specialists who see these kind of things on a daily basis uh, is 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 crucial to seek because. Although things may be risky, there may be alternative plans that you can make a workaround for. Uh, and then, as I said along the way, our, our job is to try and deliver a treatment plan that that deals with the issues that you come with. So it may be that that dealing directly with the problem um, isn't possible, but dealing around the edges may then allow us to overcome the problem that you've come with. I hope I made that clear. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think it's it. I think maybe for other patients that have been out of the service, I think it's maybe just being aware that they are still kind of 
eligible to, to access to get back in and whether it's your dentist or your GP that refers you back in um, even if it's just for an assessment and then the specialist team can provide um, a very clear plan for the local dentist if anything straightforward or arrange for any care which is required by a specialist team but don't feel that um, the access isn't there you should be able to get into the service. And I'm guessing as well because if somebody's been out of the treatment for for a long space of time treatments will have changed and evolved over the, the years so it may be what they they thought was risky or undoable several years ago you know you guys could actually say actually the treatments advanced so much yeah you're you're right there are definitely treatments that that um perhaps nowadays can overcome some of the problems that, that existed in the past uh, you're quite right yeah so um, I think there are all the questions that we've had submitted, but we have had some coming through. Um, so um, my son is going in, going in next week to have his alveolar bone graft. The adult tooth is missing. What happens to the gap where the tooth should be? Mm -hmm. So that's a great question and something that we see, see lots of. Um, obviously, I'm not going to be able to answer that question specifically for that child, um, but there are two uh, or, or three main ways that you might deal with that. I suppose the first way is to do nothing at all. Um, I think it's extremely unlikely that, that a patient would be happy with the gap at the front of their mouth, but we're always told that, that we should talk about doing nothing as one of the things that, that we should mention to patients. Um, but then I guess that there are two options and, and one is you close up the gap um, and the other is perhaps you open up the gap or hold the gap for a false tooth. So th there are lots of different sort of pathways that follow those general principles. But if you're closing up the gap, potentially you might need to consider some, uh, some orthodontics and then some clever restorative dentistry to reshape the teeth because you may have put a, a tooth that maybe doesn't necessarily match alongside another tooth. So uh, aesthetics and symmetry are something that we really think about very hard. Um, so if we're uh, looking to replace a missing tooth, sometimes we do that uh, with a tooth that we can fit onto the brace. And when the braces are finished, fit into the retainers. And then when the retainers are finished, um, the restorative dentist can, can provide some kind of semi-permanent tooth. Um, so there are lots of different options, but I guess we would choose the right one again in a collaborative way, discussing this, the risks and the benefits, the pros and the cons, and try and simulate or discuss at least the outcome that we're all aiming for. Like I said already, the orthodontists in the world are really picky about trying to make things as symmetrical as possible, as balanced as possible. Um, but, you know, we're also pragmatists, and so we, we wouldn't necessarily force patients to strive for one particular outcome we would offer you as many outcomes as we thought were were possible uh, and highlight the risks and the benefits of, of those uh, you know to, to deliver the best possible outcome in the shortest possible time Thanks. and i'm guessing this next question sort of feeds on from that um, if you have t missing teeth from the top and bottom of your mouth would you need braces on both? So I guess it depends upon are the are the missing teeth um, do the, are there baby teeth that are replacing those teeth or are the, are the baby teeth still there that haven't been pushed out? Um, because sometimes we do hang on to baby teeth, especially at the back of the mouth. Sometimes baby teeth can offer you a, a good a good tooth for decades, for 20, 30, maybe even more years. So. Um, or I guess also if, if the mouth is crowded, if there is not enough room for all the teeth or if there are very crooked teeth and you might be considering taking a tooth out to get the teeth straight, then you would potentially consider taking out that baby tooth rather than an adult one. So that you're trying to, to mm -hmm. tailor the treatment plan to fit the patient. Um, yeah, I, again, it's difficult to be specific, but but uh, if, if the lower teeth are straight, um, and you've got some missing missing adult teeth in the lower jaw, but they're straight and they look good and you don't think you want treatment for the lower jaw, you know, you can say that. Occasionally the orthodontist may say, oh, listen, I need the lower jaw to try and help me get the upper jaw right. 
sometimes we need to pitch both jaws against each other to try and enable us to get the bite better, for example. Um, but yeah, it's difficult to be specific, but those are kind of some general principles. Yeah, the orthodontist should be able to talk you through it in a more kind of individual advice, maybe show you the, um, the x-ray of your teeth and which baby teeth are left, if any, and if they plan to hold on to them and how long, you know, if they reckon they've got quite a good future or if they're probably looking like they might fall out soon and then advise you from there. And again, it's really important to just raise them your concerns or um, patients' concerns if they're worried about having both top and bottom, finding out what they're worried about and then seeing if there's a way um, they could do a, a plan of just one or explain the reasons why ideally it would be both and normally as Alex said, it's just about getting the bite as best as possible. Um, so we've just had another one come in. Um, my daughter has jaw surgery planned for early summer after her exams, having already had top braces for some time. The plan is for her top jaw to be moved forwards and lower jaw backwards. We're interested in understanding the recovery time. Do you have any useful advice? Yeah. Um... So in principle, we would normally suggest that that uh, if you're having a, a bone broken, just in the same way as if you broke your arm or you broke your leg, you'd probably be uh, more or less back to normal by about six weeks. However, in cleft lip and palate care and, and, and in jaw surgery particularly, there are some nerves that live inside your jaw bones, which when the jaws are moved, they can get upset, those nerves. And those nerves supply sensation to the skin on your lips and cheeks. Um, and although you might be eating more or less normally at six, six weeks, you might still have some numbness. And that numbness can last a long time, um, you know, up to, up to a year before it returns. And it usually returns, but we would suggest that a proportion of our patients will have some long-term numbness uh, on somewhere on their lower lip, usually somewhere in between their, their corner of their mouth and their, their, their chin. That numbness usually isn't significant and usually the benefits of the treatment outweigh the risks of that numbness. Um, but I think it's, 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 I'm sure it's a daunting thing to think, crikey, I'm going for jaw surgery soon um, because of all the things that that changes. But again, along the way, there are lots of little ups and downs. And I think that that if you can keep your eye on the long term, i.e. how things will look after it's been done, um, that should keep you fueled up and, and fit to go through the whole process. But it's a long process um, and a process that is, is a challenge. But, but sometimes our patients say that, you know what, out of all of the treatments they've had, it's not the worst one that they've had. Um, I guess that's variable, but, but ultimately it's the one that perhaps produces the biggest changes. Um, but sometimes it isn't the one that's the most uncomfortable. Yeah, and there's lots of things you can do at home to kind of help their recovery. Um, the team will normally be quite keen to get them home as soon as they can, as soon as they're, the hospital's happy. Um, so it's normally just a one, maybe you know, two nights stay in hospital, and then they can go home and have all their home comforts and if you can do as much at home to have you know all this the soft food ready your team will talk you through the things that might, might be quite good you know whether it's um nice milkshakes or things like that planning i don't know a series you're going to watch on tv finding little things to kind of keep you going um and um yeah normally about kind of just settling in at home it sounds like you've you've planned it really well in that you exams will be out the way you don't have that exam stress it's not a big time off school um so you've tried to relieve the stresses there I appreciate it's probably you know if your friends are doing things and you're not feeling quite up and ready to do stuff um in those kind of four to six weeks and just take it at your own pace but actually in the long term doing it over a summer is a really really good idea and really good time to do it so that's really um sounds like your team have planned that well um, um we've been asked to uh, You've asked for one, really. yeah, I think um, that's all we have time for, I'm afraid. Um, but thank you so much, uh, Alex and Georgie, for giving up your time tonight. Um, it's hugely, appreci hugely appreciated, um, and I'm sure you'd all agree watching at home as well. Um, thank you to everyone who has joined us online. Um, this video will be available on Clapper's Facebook page straight away, um, and a subtitled version will be posted on Clapper's website um, as soon as possible. 
if we didn't get around to answering your questions in the chat, remember you can get in touch at any time um, at info at clapper.com uh, where Clapper staff can help point you in the right direction. Uh, once again, thank you, Alex and Georgie, for uh, joining us tonight. Um, and thank you to everyone watching both now and later on. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed the Q&A um, and we'll see you again at one of our upcoming events online in the future. Um, so from all of us, good night and have a lovely rest of your week. Thanks very Bye, much. Bye-bye.